He's the medical director of UW Integrative Health and also does um, national work with Whole Health and Integrative Health through the VA. And he'll be talking about wellness during COVID. So thanks for being with us, Adam, and I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Hey, thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. So um, thank you for the opportunity to do this. And please you know, let us know in the chat box if for some reason I fade out or something with the sound. But uh, really hoping everybody can uh, jump in. I'll describe a lot of this. So if you're just on the phone, you'll get some of it. But, but this is very much a visual kind of a thing, too. So if you can see it, that's better. And of course, we'll have all the slides saved and everything. But yeah, you know, I'm, I'm recognizing a lot of the names that are coming up. But for those of you who don't know me, I'm Adam. i am uh, been in the department since I started residency here tw what, 20 years ago, the coming this July, and uh, it's never quite uh, left because uh, that's been part of the adventure. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk to you today about how do we tie in integrative health and wellness principles to, with COVID-19, you know, recognizing that it's a very new thing and we've still got a lot to learn, but what's out there? What are some re recommendations you can make and what are some things that you can use in your own practice? So just thinking about that in terms of learning objectives, I want to be able to give you the opportunity to consider what things are truly out there and what people are talking about so you can have good conversations with others about them. I try to give you some tips for deciding what to use. Uh, and then we'll get into the circle of health, which is something that we use at a lot of the integrative health clinics around the UW and it's now used throughout the VA to kind of give you some tools related to that that you can tie in. And then also, as always, resources to go deeper if you want to read more or see more. We can only cover so much in our time together. I'll talk a little bit about the state of the research um, and I'll review a few other groups' recommendations in a little bit more detail just so you can see what other folks say before we kind of give you a few recommendations from the UW and here. And in the meantime, talk a little bit more about kind of the bigger picture stuff too, because when we're talking about wellness, and, and the data is really convincing this way, you know, things like meeting, purpose, and resilience really tie in too. And if all goes well, um, you'll emerge from this with some ideas about a concrete thing you can do for yourself as well. So let's get to it. So I want to start, you know, because this is the way wellness sessions start, right, with just a moment to arrive. I know folks are coming from, you know, clinic responsibilities or whatever other meetings or so on. So let's just take five minutes, if you will, to just be in the present a little bit here. And there are four different ways I'm gonna take you through to do that. So if you can, and please resist that temptation to check your email or look at your phone while you're doing this. I, I don't have any spies peeking through your camera, but if you can just focus on you for just five minutes. And what I'd ask you to do then is just make yourself comfortable wherever you are, recognizing that there are always gonna be sounds or distractions or, or whatever, but just take a moment pause and be. And with that, we're going to do four things that can potentially bring you into the present moment, which is the essence of mindful awareness. And I'll just take you through each one, one at a time. So the first one is simply being aware of your body position. So decide how to tune into the way you're in contact with the rest of the world. If you're in a chair, that might be where your backside touches the chair or where your feet touch the floor. It might be noticing where your hands are, where your head is. Just tuning in very momentarily to your body position won't bring you into the present moment. Similarly, uh, kind of closely related to that is tuning into your senses. So just taking a moment to notice beyond proprioception what your senses are telling you. So what do you hear? It might be a duct, it might be some other outside noise, air movement, birds. What do you see? Even if your eyes are closed, your eyes are getting sensory input and you might notice colors coming through your eyelids, but visual stimulus and also whether smell, what's the temperature? Are you comfortable right now? Is there anything you need to do to be more comfortable? And then a big one too is breathing. You know, in terms of tools, one of the tools we generated that's being used for COVID is just simply uh, ways to work with fear. And something, I'm, I'm not sure how everybody else's experiences have been, but I've certainly seen a lot of folks coming in with anxiety and increased fear surrounding COVID or come in, when I say that, by telemedicine, oftentimes, or telephone or whatever, video visits. But, but the bottom line is that talking with them, sometimes it can be really helpful to take them through a breathing exercise first. 
And we know that there's kind of a sweet spot there in terms of heart rate variability in your breathing, where if you can get to your breath to between one every five seconds and one every six seconds, there's usually a sweet spot there that really triggers your bagel response and helps things settle down for you. So I'm going to see if we can do that with a few breaths, recognizing that if you need to breathe faster, just breathe faster. The key is with this exercise, just don't stop breathing because that would be bad. So uh, just uh, try to make it so your in-breath is a third as, or make that a half as long as your out-breath. Okay, so in, out, two. In, one, out, two, three. And I'm going to spread out a little bit more. In, two, three. Out, two, three, four, five, six. In, two, three. Out, two, three, four, five, six. So just sit with that. Try to bring the breath into the abdomen. Try to make that ratio work where it's in for half the length of time that you're breathing out. So sounds can help with that. And usually if you, if you have someone do that for a little while, they can really help them out. Let's just do a few more. In, two, three. Out, two, three, four, five, six. In, two, three. Out, two, three, four, five, six. And then one last thing that, that can also help with just bringing you into the moment is to tune into your heart area. You know, so often these exercises become very heady. We're often thinking a lot. So just taking a moment to drop into your heart. And a simple way to do that is just to think, think about someone who you care about very much or something. And then take a moment just to send appreciation to yourself. May I be safe and well and balanced. Kind of say that for yourself. And similarly then sending that out to all the people in your care. May they all be safe and well and balanced. And then focusing, too, on all the people who are dealing with COVID in some way, whether they have it or they're taking care of someone with it or a loved one has it, but just sending that out to them, too. May they be safe and well and balanced. May they find ease. Okay, so let's let's go ahead and come gently back out of that. You know, even a few minutes can sometimes really help just to kind of ground things. And we'll proceed. So as we move through, if you can keep tuning back into any of these four areas, it can be helpful in terms of just regrounding in the moment for a bit. So before we begin, you know, this is tricky. And I've been giving this a lot of thought over the last few months as we've been trying to develop resources for different groups and so on. But this is a new illness. And we still have a lot to learn about it. I mean, no doubt about that. We are learning more. There are a lot of studies that are being kind of published on the fly, and that's been helpful. But of course, there's still a lot to be learned. And just honoring the fact that as we're talking about COVID resources, we're talking about all the collateral call it damage or whatever that's related to this too. You know, there's a mental health pandemic out there. There's There are reports that 45% of people are saying that isolation is taking a toll on their mental health in some way. And of course, uh, a certain number, I've heard as high as 15%, I don't know, um, are suffering with things that are almost more uh, debilitating too, you know, whether it's, you know, complicated grief, depression, substance use, anxiety, et cetera. So just thinking about that and, and thinking about ways to help people out with that as well while we're going through all these different options and wellness approaches. And then, of course, now more than ever before, perhaps, and it's always important, but social determinants of health are huge right now, you know, and, and suddenly people are not only thinking about their physical well-being in terms of the virus, they're thinking about their financial and their social and their employment and their educational well-being, right? So big stuff, but... Can do it. So I think it's easiest to frame this in terms of case. So we'll just have you think about Jason. He's a 43 year old guy who's currently isolating with his partner and their two kids. All right. And he has a number of questions when he comes in to talk to you. He may just be talking to you as a family member too. But he knows that isolating and distancing and masks and all that are good. But 
He wants to know what else we, his family, can do to prevent infections. Okay, he wants to know, are there any other supplements that they should be taking? He's wondering, what if I get COVID, what, what could help me? You know, what could help us or anybody I know who gets it? Is, are there things out there you know, and that we've heard about some of the medications, but what else might be out there? And then uh, what about just being able to make it through the day? So I want you to just reflect. And um, if people could just type in the chat box for a second, one or two things that you've heard recommended for COVID-19 or the mental health or the wellness aspects or whatever. And it's not necessarily something that you agree with, but just something that you've heard recommended. Okay, it might be a supplement, a food, a approach to self-care, some kind of wellness tip, a treatment or something else. You know, we've heard all sorts of things out there, I know. But if people could do that, I'm just gonna give it a minute and then I, I can't see the chat box right now, so I'm going to have uh, Matt share with me what's in there once we have some entries. And actually, Matt, if, if you want, maybe you can just start reading some of them. It sounds like a lot of I can hear the chat. <laughs> All right, so I've got uh, zinc and vitamin C, eating app exercises, elderberry, mm -hmm. making and keeping a schedule for the day, mm -hmm. flavonoid rich fruits and veggies, mm -hmm. uh, regular wellness tips, exercise and good sleep, moving the body, vitamin C, turmeric, vitamin D, mm -hmm. tox, which I would say entertainment. Mm -hmm. I couldn't survive without Netflix, I swear. Nice. Okay, any others? Just throw them out there, folks. Appreciate it. You guys are covering a lot of good ground and, and thankfully a lot of things that I'm gonna talk about a little bit. <laughs> so that's good. Um, all right, excellent. Yes, a good sleep. Oh, I saw the cocktails, but didn't see the vitamin supplement first. <laughs> Yep, exactly. Mindful awareness. Nice. Okay, I've actually got the chat now, too. It, it popped up. So there you go. Okay, excellent. So we're going to talk about several of those things. And what I want you to do as we're moving through is we're, when we talk about criteria for deciding if something might work, try to keep that in mind with the things that you brought up. Okay, and I'll give you a few others to think about that we'll talk about at the end in terms of uh, well-being for Jason too. Okay, excellent. So, I want to share. This is kind of our word of the day here: hermeneutics. And basically, if you give kind of a looser sense of the meaning to the word, it's what we do all the time in our work, right? And do all the time in medicine and advising people, which is it's how we interpret information and how we understand stuff. And, you know, this, this was originally used, you know, to uh, talk about how people interpreted um, long honored traditional texts like the Bible or whatever. And it's kind of evolved over the centuries to include other ways of understanding meaning or how things are passed down or how we develop wisdom. And, and the reason I bring this up is because we are really trying to figure that out right now. You know, we are asking how the heck do we decide what to do? You know, what criteria do we use in order to decide that? something like melatonin or vitamin C or elderberry or any of those different things could be useful. You know, sleep, social distancing, you name it. You know, there are a lot of ways to make those decisions and it can feel a little bit overwhelming. So the way I do it, and um, I think is important, I'll share in a second, but, but I just, there's so many ways to extrapolate, right? Um, you know, most of the data that we have comes from in vitro studies. You know, what happens with other viruses or um, what do we see happen in terms of chemical pathways? And so you'll hear a lot about, and that's over there on the bottom, right? The, the uh, NLPR3 inflammasome, right? In 2002, we started to identify these separate pathways that can be triggered, especially in immune cells, but not just in immune cells, where our body responds with certain um, cytokines and so on, based on how those receptors and chemical pathways are triggered. And what's really interesting then is a, a lot of the recommendations are based on whether or not we know some of these chemicals, these supplements affect this particular inflammasome, which is the one that 
seems to go the craziest when people have COVID. So that comes up. We have animal studies as well. You know, the, a lot of the stuff on zinc is based on mouse studies. Clinical studies, well, I put ch crickets chirping in there because we still got a lot to figure out. You know, there are some studies emerging, you know, around some things, but we've got a long way to go. And of course, right now, a lot of the focus is on, you know, meds, hydroxychloroquine, and eh, maybe not, you know, remdesivir, hmm, maybe so, and that kind of thing, but a long way to go. We've got the epidemiological studies, like that one that just came out in JAMA about the, the quarantine actually does work. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, several others too. And then I think one of the things to remember as we're thinking about all this is we also have to step back and just apply the things that kind of are the time honored ones, right? For example, we know that exercise is usually pretty good for you. Um, interestingly, I did read a review where um, they argued that excess training right now wouldn't be a good idea because of the way that it activates inflammation. And there was a suggestion of keeping it to a pretty moderate level and not pushing yourself a lot if you're worried that you could be exposed. And that if you do get ill to stop because of that potential inflammation that comes, you know, with exercise related muscle trauma and so on. I don't know. But as a general rule, things like exercise, sleep, stress reduction, you know, all things in moderation, eating your fruits and veggies probably are reasonable things to talk with people about. We'll get that a tiny bit more. Uh, and then it's not just the sources of information, right? It's how you use them. And one of the things that's so tricky about this is that individual choice is so closely related to public health with this whole experience, right? And we're thinking about it in two ways. We're thinking about it in terms of prevention and trying to keep people from getting the virus or, or mental health problems or whatever, but we're also thinking of it in terms of treatment. You know, when something comes up, what can we do? And of course, everybody's different and we get this data about populations and have to figure out how to apply it to individuals. So to try to distill all this down, this is how I like to think about it these days. And I just want to provide this to you in case it's useful. And it's basically easy, the letters and the word easy. You know, so effects, sometimes there's kind of a, a dearth of those right now. We don't know the research on the effects, but then there are other things we think about too, of course. Access is one of them. Can people afford, go to, you know, sign up for a particular approach or treatment or use it, you know, can people do something like Tai Chi at home if, if we think Tai Chi would be helpful for them or whatever. Um, safety, of course, is huge, you know, um, I mean, we all heard about the huge turmoil that came up when there was discussion politically about <laughs> injecting um, disinfectants, right, and, and the safety of that. And then the last one is you, right? So, and there's an asterisk here because in this case, you know, we're oftentimes we're talking about choices that might just inter in affect one person's health, you know, oh, I'm gonna take vitamin D. You know, a lot of the choices we're talking about now, you know, social distancing, wearing a mask, going out in public, have implications for the us factor as well. So I say you as this, but it's also, you know, in the back of our minds, how that individual we're working with is gonna affect their family or, or all the other people around them. So keep this in mind, and um, I'm, as we move through, and I talked to you a little bit about some of the recommendations, what I'd like you to do is apply this to three things, okay, as we're talking at least, and you can just pick one if you'd rather, okay? But the three things that I apply it to um, are uh, fruits and vegetables, okay? That's, again, one that I said I think is probably good, but see if you agree. Uh, melatonin. You know, the hormone that we usually think of as helping you get to sleep or deal with jet lag, but has some anti-inflammatory properties. And then the last one is zinc. Okay, so fruits and vegetables, melatonin, and zinc. I want you guys to critically do an easy assessment as we move through. Okay, so let's go here. Um, this is a list, I'm not going to go through it in huge detail, but a list of kind of the go-to sites that I've encountered over the last two months that I really want to make sure people are aware of. I'm um, certainly bias to put the UW Integrative Health site up top. And then of course, the whole health library, which our team here at UW, including a number of folks who've been subject matter experts over the years have updated. And it's pretty much got a huge evidence-based review of a lot of these different wellness related things we're gonna talk about. Um, there are over 160 now, I think, different modules and they're updated on a rotating basis. Host. Enter the host so um, there's uh, also going to be, and I thought we were going to be rolling this out today, but it hasn't come out yet. Um, the Whole Health Institute, which is another group that's formed to kind of take the VA work to a national level, has a wellness toolkit. And so they're working uh, 
with, uh, with that, and I'll let everybody know when that comes out. There's some great stuff, especially about nutrition and guidelines around eating and healthy eating with isolation and so on with uh, the Harvard School of Public Health. A UW Psychiatry, as many of you saw, put out a great resource for folks with kids and families. One of my favorites is the Child Mind Institute. There's a lot in there about anxiety and grief and working with kids and how to talk to kids and activities and that kind of thing. And then uh, some others too, like UW Connect, Learn and Grow, and then a few that I'll get to in a second. If other, if other things come up for you that you don't see there, please throw them in the chat box so we have them, okay? All right, so a few points of view. I'm gonna take you through a few of these before we launch into kind of the UW Integrative Health slash Whole Health kind of way of looking at COVID, just because I wanna give you a sense. You know, I was a little, I have to say disappointed that the NIH basically just said, uh, there's no scientific that any of these alternative remedies can help. They're mostly talking about supplements. And then their site just says, look at the CDC site and follow these prevention guidelines. And that's all well and good, but it doesn't really give people a lot of guidance in terms of when they do have specific questions about them. Uh, they have a link to colloidal silver, you know, and talking about how there's not a lot of good research there um, at this point and the risk of argyria, you know, when your skin turns kind of bluish black, but, but not a lot else. On the other hand, University of Arizona tends to make a little bit more of a jump, you know, the Wild Center there. Uh, this is the recommendation list that they have primarily for um, people that's on the next two slides. So adequate sleep, right? Um, we know, for example, rhinovirus risk increases 350% if someone's gone on five hours of sleep for um, five days and then they're exposed compared to someone who gets adequate sleep and is exposed. Uh, it's that whole getting sick during finals week thing, right? Uh, stress management, we know there's a link between stress and IL-6 and other cytokine. Calm stress, still looking for a lot of detail on how and what. Um, the Deepak Chopra Foundation Library has been doing a lot of work and they've got a paper coming out on um, meditation and yoga and the relationship with inflammation. And it's, it's interesting and compelling and there is a lot of linkage potentially with that particular inflammasome I mentioned, but we've got a lot to figure out still. You know, I, my attitude would be, well, we can meditate and do yoga and it's safe and, and as long as people know what they're doing. Great. Zinc, um, there is a, some indication in mouse studies of other types of coronaviruses that it prevents viral entry into cells. Of course, that doesn't mean that we've got great data that, you know, is knocking it out of the park in terms of zinc for colds necessarily, but um, a lot of people are suggesting that as a potentially Safe option, 15 to 30 milligrams a day, so you don't overdo it and deplete copper in your body. And then flavonoids too, you know, so plant-based compounds that have all sorts of anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, most of these seem to work on that inflammasome I mentioned, as well as on the major protease that the COVID virus has been found to have. Still waiting for more details, but these are things that are found in healthy foods that we would typically recommend anyway. ECGC is in tea, curcumin is in turmeric, mercetin is in red vegetables, quercetin, apple peels, and other things. And um, I love this one. It doesn't roll off the tongue, but at least it tells you where it comes from. Licoridogenin, which is not from liquor. <laughs> I'm, I think there are people who would love to use that as a nutritional supplement sometimes during isolation, but uh, licorice is the source of that one. Okay, and then they also talk about vitamin C and the inflammasome. Um, melatonin, remember that was on your assignment list to think about, as well as zinc. And melatonin does seem to have direct effects on LRP3. You know, it does seem to kind of settle down inflammatory cell re recruitment. And so a lot of the recommendations out there are saying, take it. It's hard with melatonin because different people respond to doses differently, at least in terms of sleep. A good standard dose is 0.3 milligrams, but there are folks who will go, I've had the little ladies need six to nine to help them with you know, day, night problems. But I would tell people if they're interested, it's probably incredibly safe Then you can do it. Uh, then, then in animal studies, it does, and in I think a few studies of humans, actually, there, there have been indications that it decreases lung damage when somebody's got inflammation going on due to a virus. Elderberry, maybe I, I'm kind of waiting to hear, be a little more convinced on that one. Vitamin D seems to help um, at least when you're not actively ill. There's a question that if you have COVID, it's probably best not to take vitamin D because it might activate inflammation in, in the wrong ways. So 
activate your inflammation to keep the infection away, but then activate inflammation once you have the infection too. And then there are a couple over here uh, of lists that people have mentioned in case folks are um, interested on other conclusions that, that Arizona reached based on what's probably okay and what's not. You can go back to that if you want to go deeper with different supplements. Okay, um, the Institute for, for Functional Medicine has some, uh, some of their own opinions. Most of them are very similar, so I'm not going to belabor it too much, just so you know that this is there and it's a resource that uh, people have looked very closely at the research that's available. A lot of this pretty much what you might intuitively do anyway, you know, when you're talking with people about viruses, healthy diet, get the exercise, salt, gar salt gargles, teas, sinus care, right? Keep the sinuses clean, that sort of thing. And they talk about vitamins C, D, zinc, and then selenium, which can be an antioxidant as well. Using honey, using garlic, and getting the probiotics on board. They do have a handout for uh, clinicians that's a little bit more detailed and gets into these different individual supplements. I figure by now your head's probably pretty full of supplements, so I won't belabor these too much, except to say that they also agree that the bioflavonoids from fruits and vegetables are great. I would say get them through fruits and vegetables versus supplementing them. Now, certainly people can take them and that's probably fine. Um, they talk about melatonin too. They also mentioned N-acetylcysteine, you know, mucomest, the one we use for Tylenol overdoses, though not in that high of a dose. And um, there's some rodent studies that seem to help. And there was a study, I think it was about 230 some people with nursing home uh, patients who were going through the winter time and they gave it to them for six months and they did better than controls in terms of their overall flu symptoms that flu season. Uh, one that I've not worked a lot with is PEA. Um, it, you can get it on Amazon. There's a little bit of data for flu and early studies question about cytokine, cytokine storm stuff, but we've got a lot to learn there. Something to think about, seems to be safe, don't know. Resveratrol comes from grapeseed and so on. We talked about some of the others. Vitamin C, I don't know. I, you know, it, it may help a little bit, but, but the verdict's still out. Um, you know, certainly taking a multivitamin or getting vitamins in reasonable doses is a reasonable way to go for most folks. Oh, and part of the reason I mentioned those is because it's it's really interesting how there are a lot of kind of thinking about it in terms of things you can take or do in a little bit of lifestyle. And I, I really find my, my, my bias is that there's a lot of room for talking more about lifestyle. You know, the title of this is Wellness Tools for a Reason. And and when you think about the, this is the UW circle of whole health, we've kind of modified it to suit our own needs and may continue to do that over time. But I just wanted to make sure for those of you who haven't seen it, you know, this is just a, a graphic that we use in the consult clinics at the American Center for Wellness um, and then at visits and then also with the Arboretum Family Medicine and then other practitioners are working with it too. It's just something that uh, comes along where you can show it to people and then just ask them what stands out at you, where would you like to work? And the real key with it all, probably the most important element of this is that me in the center, which simply represents the idea of asking people what really matters to them and trying to build the plan around that with them versus trying to, you know, tell them what you want or, you know, get a little bit more um, controlling in a visit or whatever. And uh, you can get the personal health inventory, which is a questionnaire related to all this on so Connect. It was just revised with this graphic and everything. Um, UW has been doing a ton with this. Uh, there have been data just coming out in the last few months indicating that the whole health model or approach not only saves money, but seems to be significant. People with chronic pain who use it and, not, and seems to be decreasing uh, ER visits and um, medication costs. Uh, more importantly, perhaps uh, people report greater um, quality of life, subjective well-being, um, are interested in it and really feel like it makes their care good. In fact, hospital ratings go up when they introduce whole health in the VA. Okay, so uh, what always helps, there's some elements I already mentioned, you know, and this is a picture of some good news. I encourage you to watch those if you get a chance. They're great. The sixth one just came out. Uh, but individualized care, right? If you know Jake, I wish Jake could be here in front of us. We'll know a lot more what we can recommend for him. Uh, similarly, uh, talking about meaning and purpose, resilience, um, the, really asking what motivates people and then what allows them to bounce back to, what can make it so that they can bounce back even if they do get the virus, what can make it so they can bounce back even if they are struggling with the emotional impact of all of this. 
connection, especially important because of what's going on now and engagement. And I'm not going to spend time on them really, but I just put in some slides that I'll just let you know are here. Just talking about yes, meaning improves morbidity and mortality. Okay. You can always go back and look at these. We'll have the slides available for you. Purpose, many benefits as well, mortality, stroke, heart attack. There was a great study on people over 50 in JAMA a while back that indicated benefits too. Um, that was just last year. And that includes decreasing inflammation, which ties into all of this so often. And then engagement, right? The different ways to bring people in. And if people are truly engaged in their care, they do better pretty much with anything. You know, the research indicates that overall, just having people truly care about their, their plan and contribute to it matters. So I just wanted to give voice to those because I think that's key. And we know, you know, that resilience is kind of the shadow side of burnout. So playing uh, with ways to work with resilience, or maybe it's the bright side and burnout's the sh shadow side, but be that as it may, there are a lot of things that you can do with work or with your life, uh, that finding meaning, having more control, finding balance for yourself, that can sort of determine whether the scale moves toward burnout or resilience. And I just put in the 10 steps that came from this work uh, out of a couple of docs uh, from, I believe, Rochester, who talk about some of the research out there in terms of what can help, ranging from having role models to being cultivating a, a kind of an optimistic approach to looking at the world, to uh, making sure you're connected socially and keeping yourself healthy physically, to thinking ahead about what do I do if and how would I work with that? That's kind of the plan ahead piece. Okay, so circling back, I'd like you all to just take a second just to make this a little more sort of experiential and just notice which of these calls out to you right now. Okay, just pick up part of the circle. It might be, oh, wow, I'd really like to get in get a physical, or it might be, wow, um, I'm wanting to eat a little better, I'm starting to get that COVID snacking thing going, or, um, you know, whatever else comes up for you. Stress reduction, needing more sleep. A lot of people have told me their sleep cycles have changed a lot since um, isolating. Which just pick one of those things and kind of keep it in mind as we talk just a little bit here, and then we'll do some questions and answers about ways to work with this. Okay. So again, I'm not going to read all of these, but whichever one you chose, just take a little extra time to kind of look it over. And then you can always come back and look at some of these others. Okay. The me one encourages people to think about their personal health inventory, and there's a link so that you can do that with the VA version one, at least. That way you don't have to log into Uconnect. Mindful awareness, you know, how well are you doing at paying attention, taking those pauses, being in the present moment like we talked about. And we've got personal development as one of those self-care circles in the middle. Um, so much of self-care or personal development is building your resilience thinking about things that you love to do and doing them, you know, at least once a day, even when you're isolated, whether it's music or reading or so on, having that schedule maybe can be helpful. These are just some of many possibilities, but if I'm working with this with, you know, a person in clinic, I'm going to ask them for their ideas too. Okay. Uh, similarly, kind of moving through spirit and soul, you know, what, what's carrying you through this? How do you cope? What, where does your spiritual life fit in, you know, as you're comfortable with, whether it's a community or some people find it through humanism or being in nature or, or whatever. So thinking about that aspect, surroundings, this is huge right now, right? Not only are we maintaining surroundings in a certain way to prevent infection, but uh, one of the things that I would encourage everyone to think about is how much news are you watching and how is that affecting you? Um, sometimes a media fast can be really powerful. And especially now that the weather's turning increasingly great nature time as well, which is probably beneficial in terms of an anti-inflammatory. We certainly know it improves mortality as well as, you know, it's just great in its own right. Recharge, same thing. We know that sleep boosts your immune system, as I was saying. And then it's not just about getting sleep. It's about making sure you're feeling energized and what, what kinds of things can you do during the day that perk you up or get you going, okay? Getting close. Halfway through these, physical activity we talked about, and that includes stretching and flexibility and balance. Mind and emotions and ways to work with stress. And there are a lot of tools that I'll show you on the UW site in just a second for that. 
<clears throat> and then nutrition. And there's a list there of some of the power foods which have those uh, flavonoids in higher concentrations. So Arizona, for example, says get your celery, your tomatoes, your nuts, your berries, your parsley, your apples and onions. And I didn't put it on because it's always kind of creeped me out. But organ meats is also listed as one of those if, if you like your liver. Um, there are different shopping guides and menus, and I'll send you to the, the Chan School resource that's linked earlier if you want to look at that more. Okay. And last but not least, family, friends, coworkers. How do you stay emotionally connected despite being physically disconnected from people, right? Um, one of the things I, I look forward to every week is our practice team has just an informal gathering on Thursday evenings, and we just share, check in with how we're doing at the, our Breedum group, and, and that kind of thing is just really lovely and Kind of a, a bright point during the week. Professional care, who's on your team and how do you get care right now? That's a huge one to be thinking about for people. Things are getting a little easier and we're figuring out this video thing, right? At least other people are. I think I'm inept, but I'm working on it. And then community, right? Too, how we connect matters more than ever before in that global community too. Family, friends and coworkers and the bigger picture. And one of the things to be thinking about with this is not only how can community help you or others, but how can you give back? What else can you do? Even if it's just going on to like a Dane County website, you know, and, and giving a tip to someone from a restaurant that's shut down right now, you know, you can go into the tip jars or volunteer other things or help a food bank or, or whatever, checking on your neighbors. I've, I've just been delighted at how much better I've gotten to know my neighbors over the last two months. Okay. And I won't belabor this because you can go back and look at it or just go to the website, which I hope many of you have already used, but our integrative health site, thanks to Sarah R. Scott, has a number of different things that, as you see on the far right side there, tie into the different parts of the circle. So different materials that you can use for yourself or for patients or whomever to kind of guide you. And one of them is one with the easy guide and the number of cases, number 25 there. And then we've also done additional easy guides. Sarah created one for vitamin A and for which I think are really helpful and summarize the data a little more than I can in this amount of time. Okay, well, so let's go back to Jason and use easy. So I would love to hear from the chat box while people are asking any questions they have. Um, what, what do you think? You know, remember we talked about fruits and vegetables, melatonin and zinc. Uh, I'd just like to know in the chat box if people would recommend those or if there are any hesitations with them. And, there's no agenda here. It's just getting you thinking about what you would do. Okay. In the meantime, though, uh, while that's coming up, I'd love to hear any questions folks had. I know that's a lot of information. I kind of did this with the intention that folks could use the resources and go back through the slides. But uh, please, um, anything on your mind? I feel like I'm a talk show host. Got a yes to fruits and veggies. All right. Well, while people are thinking, um, you know, in terms of Jason, I, I think it's kind of fun to just run through and, and of course, a lot of it would be what his personal needs are. Right. So what, it, what really matters to him, what really matters to his family members right now. Right. And there might be a more immediate focus than a long term focus, just giving all that's going on, given all that's going on. And then trying to tailor that. So with some with with that, you know, if he, he were to come in or do a video visit, just showing him the circle and saying, hey, um, are any of these areas of focus? And I think a good rule of thumb is just talk about what you do and don't know or what we as a medical establishment do and don't know about these things. You know, so if you're thinking about zinc, just tell them, yeah, we know that it tends to be very safe at a 50, 15 to 30 milligram a day dose. Uh, we know that it might help in terms of you know, studies on cells or mice, but we haven't seen a lot of studies with humans and certainly not specific to COVID-19, but safety seems to be very good and you could consider it or, or whatever. Yeah, this is, uh, this is Jake from Verona Clinic. Yeah, hey Jake. Yeah, and so I guess like, uh, I, I love the idea of kind of tying in like whole whole wellness. So like looking at, you know, everything that a patient can do and like try and, I feel like it's easy for people to say, oh, I can't go outside now or I can't leave my apartment, but trying to give them a, you know, motivational interviewing uh, them to wanting to be active and wanting to take uh, ownership of their healthcare. I think that's really important. And uh, providing some of these like vitamin supplements, I think are, is helpful. And it's also like 
in a way of painting the picture, like there's other things that you are also able to do. How do we get you there? Exactly. I think you you point out such an important thing, which this is really kind of an empowerment approach, right? I mean, we may not always know how much something's going to do as long as someone's safe and they feel like they have a little choice. You know, it's kind of like that that graphic with the resilience and burnout, right? Resilience is much more likely in the workplace or anywhere if people feel like they have a certain amount of choice over what's going on with them. And right now, of course, as we all know, choice feels pretty limited in many ways. So I, I, great point. And thank you. All right, well, as we're wrapping up, I just want to say, so think about one of those things, and this is your homework assignment, should you be willing to accept it, right, which is pick one of those areas and just do it for yourself. Just simply, just simply do it for yourself. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and sign off. I don't know, Tom, if there's anything else you want to say about next week or the coming lectures, but thank you all so much. Thanks for being on, and I hope this is useful. Feel free to drop me an email with any questions, of course, okay? Thanks, take care, stay well.